Okay, good evening, everyone. I think uh, about time to begin, uh, maybe two or so minutes early, but I think uh, the others should be with us shortly. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just checking, make sure you can hear me okay and uh, see the screen okay. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Well, I'm going to begin today with a little bit of going back over the, the part about theme. Uh, that was where we had left off last week. So I thought I would uh, proceed with that. Uh, just a minute, if I just want to turn off the, the headphones here. Okay, that's better for me at least. Uh, so we go back to textual meaning. How is the message organized? And this is very important because it's very much related to what we've talked about as the rhetorical structure, the architecture of the text. Uh, how is the message organized? Two aspects that we've mentioned, theme and information. Theme here in a very Hallidayan sense. Uh, Halliday uses this term, a theme. It means the, the initial uh, initial part of the, the clause, the, the, how the clause begins. And so let's go back over a bit of this. Theme is the initial grammatical element. And so when you say a grammatical element, you think of something like grammatical subject, uh, the complement, the verb, and so on. Focus, another, th another matter altogether, and that deals with, in English, remember, both of these what Halliday is describing is in English, in the English language. Uh, these aspects, theme, focus, as a matter of tonic prominence, intonation. Now, that doesn't mean that theme is not also, and a number of scholars, uh, linguists, have looked at, for example, Chinese, and have identified also uh, what they would also call theme in Halliday's sense. Uh, but the issue of Intonation in English, well, that would, is a different matter. That relates to focus. Focus meaning that what you are what you're identifying is the the new element, and it's given a certain, as Halliday puts it, tonic prominence, meaning you your intonation goes up at a certain point and and falls in that peak. That peak is where it's identifying new information. Again, the slide I've shown you before, what's theme? Theme is the initial grammatical element. Now there's another phrase here that's used, the first experiential element. Is there a difference between the two? And which is it, you might say? All right, well, now, when we talk about the experiential element, what do we mean? Three things. Process, participant, circumstance. It relates to what kind of meaning? Experiential meaning, ideational meaning, the idea, what it is you're talking about. Halliday's point is that every clause will begin at the beginning there will be an experiential element. It, it may be a participant. John's already left. Yesterday, maybe a circumstance. We don't have any examples here of a verb, but we could easily make up one. Uh, close the door, all right? The verb comes first. His spirit, the complement. People who live in glass houses, again, that's the, the subject, grammatical subject, with an embedded clause inside. So these are all examples of an, a, the first experiential element. It may be the grammatical subject, maybe an adjunct indicating circumstance, maybe the, the complement, maybe the, the, the predicate, maybe the verb, okay? There is always, Halliday would argue, always a, an initial experiential element. Now, that doesn't mean that other things might not come before it. And so we gave this example, but Mary, 
I do love your cooking. And, and the first experiential element is I. Now, Halliday's point is, that's where you sort of find the boundary between theme and what follows. Theme is, first of all, more or less obligatory is the first experiential element. You first look for the process or participant or circumstance that's at the beginning of the clause. You identify that as the first experiential element. I, in this case, I do love your cooking. Now, whatever comes before it serves another purpose. Well, what do we mean purpose? Another function, another meta function. So in this example, but serves a textual function. Mary serves an interpersonal function. All right, so well, how do you identify sort of what's the theme structure of a clause then? First, identify the first experiential element, which will also be a grammatical element. And then if there's anything that occurs before it, it will be either interpersonal or textual. We did say though that there are some special grammatical constructions, <clears throat> excuse me, some special thematic structures. We identify two, predication, which has a special meaning, meaning that what you are putting first is basically new information, not what's been said before. Now this sort of goes against what we usually do, because what do we usually put at the beginning? Old information, information that's already been given, all right? That's usually how we begin, but that's why this is a special thematic structure. Here, you're, you're actually putting new information at the end. Now you signal it by using a predicate structure. It's John which effectively makes John the, the end of a clause. It's is John, it's John. But it occurs at the beginning. You, you create a special predicate structure. It is theme, it occurs first. And this structure identifies something by saying, it's John, I want, it's not who you were thinking. It's not what was in your eye, in your head, no. New information, I want John, it's John I want. I hope that's clear. Identification, identification again, if you look at it in English, again, we're talking about in English. If you see a phrase that begins with a WH word and is really a clause, what I need, for example, you're indicating to the person who you are speaking to that it is this, and this alone, what I need is a new car. This and this alone, a new car, that's what I need. Okay, so you do have special sort of thematic structures. Now we said as you progress through the text, you are making continuous choices about what will be theme. And there are three possibilities. Linear, continuous, and derived. Now, derived and continuous are quite alike in some respects. So let's deal with linear first. And again, I gave you this example, this journal article. Now, what we're saying is that in, for example, clause 1A, what's the new information? A holiday also, there's a word that you'll probably come across as you're reading. There's theme and then there's ream. What's ream? It's spelled like theme, but with an R. It is whatever follows the theme. So you have theme and then you have ream. What is ream? What's left over? And then within the ream, very often will be the new information. And how do you identify it? <clears throat> Sorry, again, it's intonation, tonic prominence, and location toward the end of that clause. So 
in Clause 1A, what's the focus? What's the new information? Extending their ranges toward the poles. In Clause 1B, what is the new information? Again, what comes it toward the end of the clause? Earlier in the spring than previously. Now, why I like this example, it, it very clearly illustrates linear thematic progression. You're taking the new information from 1A and the new information from 1B and repackaging them together, putting them together as nouns because they're going to be the grammatical subject. You're taking these range expansions and changes in the timing of seasonal events. That is your theme. The theme becomes the new information from 1A and the new information from 1B, what occurred at the end of 1A, what occurred at the end of 1B, and taken together and combined to how you begin the second sentence. That's linear thematic progression. What occurs toward the end of the clause, the new information, once it is said, it becomes old, and then it is then made theme of the next sentence, the next clause. Now, continuous thematic progression is where you keep repeating the same thing as theme. Derived would be that you are not necessarily repeating the same thing as theme, not like here, the two, both, 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 you're always repeating about the two dictionaries. It would be words that are sort of of a similar nature. For example, if I was describing a car and when I looked and looked at the theme structure, suppose I pick up one of these brochures for a new car. Well, it may, I may notice, I don't know, but I may notice that the clauses begin mentioning parts of the car. The body of the car, the engine of the car, and those things are all themes. So it's all sort of related. It's all sort of derived from the topic about cars, and that's what is made theme, okay? Now, the point is that when we, meet, when we talk about theme, it is very important in terms of, it, it gives a sense of coherence to the text. Now, this is an example provided by Jim Martin. Uh, let me read it. I think governments are necessary because if there weren't any, there wouldn't be any law. People would be killing themselves. They help keep our econ economic system in order for certain things. If there wasn't any federal government, there wouldn't be anyone to fix up any problems that occur in the community. It's the same with the state government. If the state government didn't exist, there wouldn't be anyone to look after the schools. Vandalism and fighting would occur every day. The local government is important to look after rubbish because otherwise everyone would have diseases. Now, it is grammatically correct. Is it good writing? No. Because it sort of has, a, it's, it has a particular way of arguing. It's called spoken counterfactual argumentation. It, ha it has an introduction, it has arguments, but it, it sounds rather spoken-like. I think governments are necessary because if there weren't any, there wouldn't be any law. If there wasn't any federal government, there wouldn't be anyone to fix up any problems. It's the same as state government. If state government didn't exist, if such and such didn't exist, there wouldn't be. And that's repeated. Sort of a counterfactual argumentation. It's more common in spoken than it is in written. And if you take a look at what's theme, well, you can't really say, well, yes, there's a lot of continuous thematic progression there, there, there. But you'll notice that the 
what is indicated as theme doesn't really tell you very much about what this text is about, does it? No, it's it, they, I, from looking at the theme, what occurs first in these clauses, I really wouldn't have much idea about what the text is about. But you see, we do use theme when we read and hopefully when we write to get a grasp of what is being said, what is being written about. All right, so we can make some quick changes here. Let's put in sort of what it is about. And we can make it, we can, as it says, reinforce the rhetorical structure through a more strategic use of theme. Governments are necessary at different levels. They make laws. They help keep our economic system in order. The federal government, the state government, the local government. All right, so I have a, have a sense of the sort of the organization. And theme is helping me with this. Can it be improved? Yes. Well, let's add something that indicates sort of textually how it develops. And so we can add, and this is what's been, been put here in, in blue. We have to begin similarly, finally. And these all serve a sort of textual function, right? Textual theme. And so we've combined, we have now the ideational, the textual. Let's play with this a bit more. Besides conjunction, besides what we use as theme, let's sort of make a connection involving progression. So when I start off, I, I say these have to do with, what are these? Several reasons, well, several reasons, these, all right? That's linear thematic progression. These have to do with special responsibilities of governments at different administrative levels, federal, state, and local. Ah, federal, state, and local. Now notice, each of those, what I've indicated as sort of the, the new information is now becomes one, the federal government, two, the state government, three, the local government. All right, so you'll notice that, and again, what's the federal government deal with? Problems. What's the state government deal with? Schools. What's the local government deal with? Rubbish. As a result of their concern with general difficulties, schooling, waste disposal. Now that's what we put it, the theme of the final paragraph. So it all begins to sort of connect up. And it begins to look better, right? All right, let's try a few questions. Let's see how you do. Which of the following sentences contains a textual theme? A, please don't run in the house or you might break something. B, last night I went to bed early. C, the text for your reading assignment has been uploaded to Canvas. D, both B and C, E, none of the above. All right, so is there a textual theme here? What do you think? Any ideas? Someone has said A. Any others? Any other suggestions? Is A correct? If A is correct, and there seems to be more, D, mm, let's see. Where is there an example of textual theme. Or, or is textual theme. Now notice that there's two clauses here, right? So the conjunction of the second clause is what we would consider textual theme. We're looking at theme for every clause, not just the sentence, but it's every clause. So if you've got a sentence with more than one clause, each clause will have its own theme. Now, Last night, I went to bed early. 
there's nothing there. Last night is the circumstance is theme. The text for your reading, C, the text for your reading assignment has been uploaded to Canvas. What's theme? The text for your reading assignment, grammatical subject. All right, so those are last night, adjunct, circumstance is theme. The text for your reading assignment, grammatical subject is theme. A is the correct answer. Excuse me. All right, what, what about two here, the, the next Hello? one? Which of the following are among the defining criteria for a text? Cohesiveness, long enough, coherence. All of the above are both A and C. What do you think? Any, any responses? Which of the following are among the defining criteria for a text? Oh, you're all saying E. All right, so let's see. A and C. A, yes, cohesiveness. B, long enough? No. Doesn't matter. Text has nothing to do with length. All right? It can be a simple utterance. Fire. Okay, that would be one word, utterance. But it is a clause, all right? It doesn't have all of the elements there. It's sort of an abbreviated clause, but I'm shouting fire. Not length, coherence and cohesiveness. E is the correct answer. All right, let's try the next. Which of the following contains an interpersonal theme? Certainly. I prefer you were there. Carefully, he poured the tea. But Mary, I do love your cooking. All right, well, that one is easy because you've already heard that. You know, Mary, but any of the others? What about carefully? But that's the manner, right? How he poured the tea. That's a circumstance. Certainly. Now, there is an expression of attitude. Modality. That is interpersonal. So the correct answer is both A and C. Not B. That's, that's part of what we call experiential. It's the circumstance. It's how he did it. Next one. In an English language clause. Old Given information typically occurs as theme at the end of a clause, focus at the end of a clause, theme at the beginning of a clause, focus at the beginning of a clause, or none of the above. What do you say? Any responses? Most of you got that. Theme at the beginning of a clause. Last one. Which of the following illustrates linear thematic progression? I saw the debate, but I still don't know who I should vote for. The parade came down the street and then suddenly stopped. The restaurant just opened after renovation and it has a new menu. Now, which of the following illustrates linear thematic regression. Now remember, what is linear? Linear is where the focus becomes the theme. What occurs at the end of a clause is what occurs at the beginning of the next clause's theme. I saw the debate. What's theme, by the way? I. But I, again I, repeated, still don't know who I should vote for. Okay, so it's none of the above, by the way. The parade came down the street and it sort of elliptic here. The parade then suddenly stopped. The restaurant just opened after renovation and it, referring to the restaurant, they, they're all examples of continuous thematic progression. All right, 
Now, what I'm sure most of you were quite eager to, to hear about and what I'm sort of eager to explain to you, your homework tasks. And I, that's what I'm going to be discussing now for the next, uh, next few minutes, okay? You can see that sort of got all over. You can see that there are going to be five parts to this. The first four are various steps in the analysis of a clause. The first step will be clause-based analysis. Second step, theme analysis. Third, transitivity. Fourth, logical. And you can see when these will be due. Step one, week five. Step two, week six. Step three, week eight. Step four, week 10. And then finally, there will be a commentary about the text that you've been analyzing, 800 words, which will count for another 20%. Let me continue. What I want you to be paying attention to is this. In real life, Halliday, this is what Halliday says, texts carry value. And we need, as he puts it, we need to explain that value in terms of what we know about semiosis, how about how meaning and about meaning and about how meaning is made. I'm going to be giving you a text. Now, as you go through the, the analysis here of a text, and I'll show you what that text is, I will be sort of step a step ahead of you, showing you my analysis of another similar text. So for example, today I will talk about clause-based analysis and I will illustrate with a particular text and you will be doing then similar, something similar and that will be due in week five, all right? That'll be due on the 10th of February. So I'm sure you're wondering what's the nature of the text. And it goes with this idea, what texts carry value. Now, I'm going to illustrate. The text that you're going to be doing is a spoken word performance. A spoken word performance. You see, I was quite interested. Uh, recently, America's Got Talent. And... Uh, for the very first time, America's Got Talent, it wasn't a singer, it wasn't a dancer, it wasn't gymnastics that won the final award of America's Got Talent. It was a spoken word performer. Now this is exceptional, very much against what you would expect. A spoken word performer. What's spoken word? Basically poetry. Poetry? When America's got talent? So I'm going back to this question then. How does that text, how did that spoken word performance get the public, basically, attracted enough to what he was doing, impressed enough with what he was doing to vote for him. And so that he ends up winning this America's Got Talent. It's a very interesting question. So I want, we, Halliday says we should be able to explain that value. We should be able to explain why people responded the way they did. And this is the challenge. So when you see the commentary on the text, this is the challenge, which is part of the commentary. What about, because when he went through America's Got Talent, he, he gave several performances. 
the text that I'm going to do as a model is the one that he, he did for his first audition at the very beginning. And I've chosen another text for you guys to do. Again, I will be a step ahead of you. We'll talk about it. I'll illustrate it with the other text. You will be doing something quite similar. I mean, what you will be doing will be very much the same, but the text will be quite similar. All right, let's, uh, let's see what was the response when he came out to do his first audition. Hi, how are you? <laughs> what is your name? My name is Brandon Leak. Hi, Brandon Leak. And where are you from, Brandon? I am from a small little city called Stockton, California. Stockton, California. And what do you do for a living? Uh, for a living, I, I work at a high school and a college, but I also run poetry workshops with youth in my city. Oh, well, that's wow. wonderful. Yeah. Wow. So poetry, is that, is that what you're going to be doing tonight? Yes, I'm actually the first spoken word artist that you guys are ever going to have hit the stage. So I'm super excited to bring poetry to y'all. Tell me, because uh, I don't really understand poetry, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a great intro for you. I, I bring more about life experience, things that everyday people go through. And, and where could this lead to if you did well on the show, Brandon? Well, I have like a huge aspiration of being able to put on my own large production one-man show. Okay, so t tonight's poem, is it something you wrote? Oh, I only perform stuff that I write, never be able to perform anything else. Well, and what is it, what is this one about? So tonight's poem is actually a, an ode to my sister. Are you close to your sister? Very much. She's here with me now. Oh, she's back backstage? Kind of. <laughs> well, we already love you. Make us love your poem. Beautiful. I got you for that. Okay. Now, I haven't played the poem for you. I just wanted you to notice the response in before you hear the poem, before you hear his performance, you can see sort of at the beginning, there's sort of a, a skepticism about the fact that he's there, America's Got Talent, never had anyone like that before. And there's sort of a skepticism among the judges as to poetry. Well, this was the response. Okay, again, this is not the poem. This is after he has done his performance, this was the response. Wow. It is a wow. Flowers across the sea, memories are what they used Gosh. to be. You're tearing up. My brother passed away the same year that your sister passed away. Man. Yeah, I can feel your pain. I know what this is. I know what it is to have somebody taken from you without you knowing. But it was very beautiful for me. Thank you. What an amazing tribute. There's something very, very special about you. Thank you. Really. This is a very difficult thing for me to judge. I shouldn't be judging it. I just want to compliment you on what you just did because it was uh, extraordinary. Thank you for so much. Really? So much. Well, it's amazing to me that on season 15, it's the first time that we're hearing somebody of spoken word. There was something more raw in the way it's like singing and talking and just being a human a cappella. No music, no nothing, just a raw heart beating in front of us. We feel your pain. We feel your love, and you moved me to do this. They speak of a better place. They speak of kingdom. Kingdoms and how they come. They speak of freedom. Now, 
that was the response. And the golden buzzer, buzzer sorry, is a, basically a, a free pass, it means, to the live shows where, where he will have to compete with other contestants and it'll be based on uh, the public's voting for the person of their, the performance of their choice. So this takes him a step farther, all right? Well, that was the response. Now, you can see the response has been, I mean, quite, quite remarkable. And it is, as, as one of the judges said, it's just a human a cappella. It's, it, it's, uh, it's no music, nothing else except the person speaking, just language. So what was there about, can we explain why people responded, why these judges responded the way they did? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be analyzing his spoken word performance. I'll do an analysis of one, you'll do an analysis of the other. This is the text that I'm going to ask you to analyze. Now, I'll show you in a minute where it is on canvas, all right? But this is the text that I'm going to ask you to, to analyze. You can see it's about 20, 20 sentences. And he's got everything. This I, is, I, every, America, this just is sit that quietly, listen, right? take it in. When I'm up here on stage, they call me Brandon. <laughs> when I'm with my homies, they call me B. And when I'm with the ladies, let's just say, they call me Taken because I'm already happily spoken for. But when I'm back at home, my mama, she call me Pookie. And no, I'm not afraid to admit it, my mother calls me Pookie at like the most inopportune moments. For instance, today, on my way here to America's Got Talent, my mom screamed out the front door, make sure that you call me when you get there. Pookie. <laughs> and like, I get why my mother says it out of courtesy, but to be real, I don't understand why my mom's so concerned with my safety, praying for me as I leave the house on a daily, cause I'm just a young man who has faith in Jesus. The same way that stars have faith that space will protect them from this galactic bully we call gravity who longs to turn their star to a splendid spectacle for passive buyers to watch in awe of its death. So yes, I never really understood the issue. <laughs> and then I went on Facebook and I realized that my mama loved me the same way every mother loved their son, fearfully. Because normally, death don't really bother me. I mean, I'm from Southside Stockton. I'm all too familiar with how some family reunions only ever take place on graveyard grass and how a hole can be a safe haven for a soul in this mortal game of hide-and-go-seek. But there is something so different about Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake and the countless others. And as I stared at that screen, I couldn't help but think I was looking at a mirror image of myself being choked out, familiarly existing, or but daring to be more than three fifths of what them folk thought them to be. Or maybe it was simply due to their hue. And in that moment, I better understood my black mother's greatest fear was every time I leave her home on the other side of my phone, will no longer be her son, will be America's next most popular hashtag accompanied by a video of her young star being gunned down by gravity as my stardust has turned splendid spectacle for pacifiers to watch in awe of my death. So yes, my mother's greatest fear is that I won't return home breathing, blood pulsing through these veins enough to still be her pookie. And my mama warned me, son, don't you dare get caught at the wrong place at the wrong time with that wrong colored skin because those three strikes, they lead to pine box convictions and I need you to return home my pookie again. So dear mom, I promise you this, I will do everything in my power to make it back home to you. But if I don't, just know you was the very last thing on my mind. And I will always, always 
be a pokey. Brandon Leak. That was very, 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 very powerful, and I'm happy that you chose this platform to talk about what you just did. I think it is so important. Your spoken words, your honest words, your true words, your necessary words. Thank you. You are my favorite act of the night. Sophia. What a great way for us to end the night. It's something special, that talent that you have. And I really wish you the best luck tonight because I want to I wanna keep hearing you. I want to see what you can bring next. Howie. Well, I got to say, this is above and beyond anything I've seen, anything I've ever heard, especially at this time. It was so perfect. You took a, you know, an older white guy and put myself into the body of an African-American mother just hoping that her son survives life. And this is the conversation we're having now. This is the conversation, I'm not getting political, but this is the conversation that America needs to have. And there is no better, more entertaining, more woke, more educational way. I am so proud to be here in this room. I'm so proud that I pushed the golden buzzer. In my heart, you just won the whole night. You really did. Okay. So that's the text that you, you're analyzing. You're, you're going to be analyzing it for those four aspects. Clause structure theme, transitivity, you remember that was what was the kind of process and who are the participants, and the logical structure, how the, how the clauses are, are combined. Those four analyses. And then at the end of it, you're going to be writing something about the text. And how it, how it, why it meant what it did to those that heard it. Why the response that people had for it. As I told you, I'm going to be analyzing the, the first text, the, the first spoken word performance that he gave, which you've now seen the reaction to. This is it. I have two facts for you. One, I'm six feet tall. <laughs> and two, love is the most vulnerable thing one will ever have. And you must learn to hold on to it loosely so when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. On July 14th, 1996, an angel was brought to this earth. Her name, Danielle Marie Gibson, but I only know her as Puff. Her smile is as wide as the universe. Her eyes, they glimmer like the star. She is my world and my sister. I, just four years old at the time, learned what it meant to love selflessly for on days in which my strength was but knee high. Seeing her smiling face would make my soul fly. But on March 23rd, 1997, I've been groundbound because she left Earth to go back home amongst the stars, right next to God. But I was left here to manufacture wings out of tears and broken dreams. Yet I'm still haunted by these nightmares because I have a really creative mind. And sometimes it designs these alternate realities where she is still here, still alive. And all the things I wish we could have done are played again and again and again. And I'm tired of playing God because I got to come to terms with the fact that my sister ain't never coming back. And that's the cost of love, caring for someone so much that you can't imagine living life without them, staring at a grave like, how about I trade my six feet for yours, but that's not real. And I know I said earlier to hold on to love loosely, so when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. But if this pain and these memories are all that I got left of you, I won't never regret these scars from just trying to hold on to you. Now, I've been working on an analyzing this text. Now, I've noticed some things, and over the course of the next few weeks, 
I'll be talking about my analysis for this text and subsequently giving my commentary about how and why people responded the way they did. I hope you find this sort of intriguing because it is sort of a, it is interesting to find out what there is about the way we speak that makes people value it, respond to it the way they do. And what I'm hoping is that out of this sort of exercise, you're, what you're going to be appreciating is the fact that where to look for this and how to find out how, how to be able to explain it, as Halliday said, how people value something, it's to look at it in the language. It's in the language. It's in the grammar. And so this sort of exercise is to sort of, I hope we'll be ending up giving you an appreciation for the fact that you can be analyzing a text and afterwards come to a realization of how the text comes to mean what it does. Now, again, we're, there are other aspects to look at in, in looking at a text like this. There is um, the intonation, there is the, the voice quality, there are, are, there are a lot of factors here. We, don't, we won't touch on them all not expecting you to touch on them all. I'm just here expecting you to be working on looking at a text in terms of, first of all, the clause analysis. What that means is just basically, and this is the first assignment, to take what I've already given to you as a text, and again, as I said, I'll show that to you where it is in Canvas in a moment. Some of you have already found it, and in fact, one of your classmates uh, identified some typos in, in the text itself, and thank you very much. I appreciate that uh, because I, I was basically uh, had to listen to the text and then transcribe it, and uh, thank you. If you find errors, I appreciate it. All right, let me, let me go through. Now, this is to explain you your first assignment. And I want you to sort of do it like this, as I'm, this is the model I'm providing to you. Again, clause one, I have two facts for you. This is a simple clause. Now, I've underlined here the verbs and so forth, because one of the ways that you can more easily identify what is a clause is to identify the verbs. Now, not at this stage, we're not to the stage of identifying what kind of process. No, just identify the verb. Because when you do so, you'll identify what's a clause. A clause, everything else is optional except the verb, basically. All right, so I have two facts for you. That was a simple one. The second one, one, I'm six feet tall. Again. Simple clause. Three. And two, love is the most vulnerable thing. Now, you'll notice that I'm indicating here there's another clause, 3B, and I put it in, I not only identified its clause 3B with those angle brackets, I've also put it within square brackets. Why did I do that? I'm identifying the fact that it is an embedded clause. It's really a, a relative clause. You remember what we talked about? We talked about parataxis, hypotaxis, and rank shifting. Remember embedded clauses? And this would be an example of that. We've dropped the, well, he has dropped the which, all right? The most vulnerable thing which one will ever have. All right. so. A relative clause, the WH may be ellipted, may be deleted. So that's an embedded clause, all right? And I'm going to indicate that it's part of the noun phrase, which thing is the head, 
and it's a post modification, right? 4A. And you must learn 4B to hold on to it loosely. All right, so again, we have two clauses. One is a main clause, the other is a dependent clause, a two infinity. And then there, it continues though, four continues. So, so now we have a 4C. So when it leaves 4D, it won't exit so painfully. So we have basically one sentence with four clauses. All right, so continuing on. Five, on July 14th, 1996, an angel was brought to this earth. Her name, Daniela Marie Gibson. All right, her name, Daniela Marie Gibson, there's no verb there. So we just would treat that as sort of a, an, a positive. It's two noun phrases next to each other. And then 5B, but I only know her as Puff. Okay, but, and then another, another clause, all right? Again, I do recommend you do that. Go through, just identify the verbs, and then it'll be much easier for you to sort of identify. And all you're doing at this stage, all you're doing is basically numbering the clauses. The numbers themselves, for example, five, now that was the fifth sentence, all right? So you're numbering them according to the sentences, but within that sentence, you have two clauses. So the A and the B stands for the two clauses. Now, even if it is an embedded clause, you still indicate that as maybe A, B, or C, but you're putting it in square brackets. That identifies that it is, it's not functioning at clause level, it's part basically of a noun phrase, most likely a kind of pre-modification. Six, her smile is as wide as the universe, a simple clause. Her eyes, they glimmer like the stars, a simple clause. She is my, sis, she is my world and my sister, simple clause. Nine, all right, I just, I just four years old at the time learned, and then I have an embedded clause. It starts with a WH. It's really kind of a nominalization. What it meant to love selflessly. That whole thing is sort of packaged up as the, the object of learn, what it meant to love selflessly. You'll notice that many nominalizations begin with sort of that WH word, all right? You're packaging it all as a kind of almost noun, noun phrase, nominal group, but really it's two clauses together. Both of them are embedded. We're almost done, all right? 10, for on days, now here again we have a a relative clause in which my strength was but knee high embedded. And that whole thing basically is the, a circumstance. Notice the numbering, all right? Because the four on days is just the circumstance. Now it continues with the next clause. 10C though is, is the subject. Now this one thing you might begin to notice is that the Clause complexity is becoming greater as it proceeds. It started rather simple. But notice here, 10A, now the embedded clause is still part of the sort of the circumstance. It's part of the adjunct for on days in which my strength was but knee high. It just describes the when. 10A continues now with the subject. The grammatical subject is also a clause. Seeing her smiling face. Now, because it's functioning as a nominal group in that slot of grammatical subject, again, we treat it as this nominalization, as a clause which is functioning like 
a noun phrase, like a nom, or some people call it nominal group. It's grammatical subject. Would make, make, that's one verb, my soul fly. It's another verb, right? That 10 is pretty complicated. 11, but on March 23rd, 1997, I've been ground bound. 11B, because she left earth. 11C, to go back home amongst the stars right next to God. More straightforward, no embedding here. 12, but I was left here. 12B, to manufacture wings out of tears and broken dreams. Okay, continuing. 13. Now, 13 is a really complicated, really complicated, okay? And it's, I, I believe it's really purposeful, really deliberate. It's when his voice becomes more uh, excited, more agitated, emotional, and, and you'll see that it, it, he's packed so much into this sentence. Yet I'm still haunted. Now, you might say, well, I'm, you got the verb to be still haunted. Uh, now, why did I not identify that as two separate clauses? Well, because the verb to be there is part of the passive voice construction. It's an auxiliary verb. All right. I'm still haunted by these nightmares. All right. So that, that's still one clause. The main verb haunted. All right. Passive voice. The verb to be there is just an auxiliary verb to indicate the passive voice. Because I have a really creative mind. Okay. Clause. Sometimes it designs these alternate realities. Another clause embedded then to describe it where she is still here, still alive, continuing, and all the things, again, embedded, I wish, continues on, we could have done, describes things, post-modification of things, are played again and again and again. 13H, and I'm tired of playing God. Object of the preposition. It has a prepositional phrase, but it's a ver it's a clause. All right, treat it as embedded, because I gotta come to terms with the fact. What's the fact that my sister ain't never coming back? Embedding. There's lots of embedding here. Yes, it's very, it's much more complicated than anything we've seen so far. But that will most likely be part of the story as far as part of the craft. Now, this is the point. This is a spoken word performance. It's not just, it's not just him speaking. This is, he is doing it as a poet. It, there is a design to it. There's a craft to it. And what you're trying to dig out here is what, what's part of the craft? What's part of the design? That, that, made people respond the way they did. I remember, because I was watching America's Got Talent, I remember him coming out, and I remember being so struck listening to his performance. I likewise felt very moved by it. Every time he did his spoken word performance, what was, what was making, but it wasn't just me responding like that, as a linguist, I try to be more objective. And so when I'm talking about a certain sort of response, I'm, I'm very curious about how people respond to it. So the fact that the judges responded the way they did, the way the, the public did, we're almost done. 14, and that's the cost of love. 14B, ING verb, dependent clause, caring for someone so much that you can't imagine living life without them staring at the grave, like how about I trade 
by six feet for years, but that's not real. So it's one clause after another. And finally, 15. And I know, I said earlier, to hold on to love loosely, so when it leaves, it won't exit so painfully. The only sort of, we do have some embedding, but if this pain and these memories are all that I got left of you, I won't never regret these scars from just trying to hold on to you. That's my analysis. Now, I welcome questions about my analysis. They may not occur to you tonight. It may be uh, during the week as you're looking at it and looking at your own text, you come up with questions. That's fine. And uh, the point is, in doing this assignment, now, by the way, now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting all of these analyses into an Excel file. But for the sake of this first part, the clause analysis, I want you to be just sort of presenting it like what I've done here, as in a Word document, okay? Do the clause analysis with all the tagging and so forth, and do that as sort of a, a Word document, all right? In the end, we're going to be putting it together in an Excel file and doing the theme, transitivity, and logic. I'll show you that in a second. First of all, clause-based analysis now of that Pookie text. Now, this will be due on the 10th of February. That's, that's week five. That's next week, all right? On the 10th. And we will set up the canvas so that you can submit it online. And I haven't done that yet. And uh, I have an assistant for the course and uh, the assistant will set this up so that uh, by the due, that within the next few days, it, it, should be, it should be set up. Now, really this should be quite, now I'm gonna say it, easy. Yeah, it'll be a challenge. It'll be a challenge as you're going through it, but keep this in mind. These four steps that you're going to be doing, you're going to do the analysis. As long as you do the analysis, and I accept that you might make some mistakes and so on, as long as I, it, it seems a real genuine effort to analyze it, you'll get the five points. In other words, I'm not going to say, if you make a mistake, I'm going to take off a point here and a point there. No, as long as I see a really genuine effort to do the analysis, and yeah, you might make some mistakes, try not to make too many. As long as you make the mis as long as you do, not as long as you make the mistakes, as long as you do the analysis, you can earn that 20% very easily as long as you diligently do the four kinds of analysis of that text. The commentary, that will be something that's going to be really what I'm going to be looking for is not just the analytical skills, but really how you're able to make an observation from the analyses that you've been looking at. There, that will be the more challenging part. And that's where some of you will do better than others. But as we go through it, hopefully, hopefully all of you can get a grasp on what's going on here. Now, as again, as I say, the commentary will be explaining the value based on your analysis of the text. Now, before I get that, we'll come back to the, this. I want to, uh, if I may, go to Canvas and show you there. All right, you're looking at it, right? Yes. All right, now, uh, so what we're looking at, uh, by the way, week four, you've got the grammatical analysis, uh, theme view. Now, in fact, I'm already giving you what the theme will be like. I'll be, I'll go through it uh, the, after you finish the clause analysis. 
I'll come back and talk about my analysis of the theme structure here. So you'll notice I put it into a, an Excel table, all right? I indicate the first column, paragraph, clause, subclause. That would be the A, B, Cs, and so forth. And then theme, textual, interpersonal, topical, displaced. Now, don't worry about those various aspects now. Saying you'll be doing the, the Excel file, all right? And the Excel file, now I'm going to close this. Go back up to the, in your, if you're in Canvas, go to the homework files. Now you find that there is a grammatical, it's called grammatical analysis template, empty. And if you, you can't see it that well here, but you go back and open it and you'll see that your, this has three sort of parts to it. On one page, one sheet, you'll be doing the theme analysis. Another, you'll be doing the transitivity analysis. Another, you'll be doing the logical analysis, all on the Excel file, all right? So the only analysis that you'll do sort of with a Word document uh, of the four analyses will be the clause one. The others will be done on the Excel worksheet. Now, that's why you can see the, this is the sort of the template. I give you the template you fill in the data and so forth. You close that. And also here I have put the video, all right? So you can watch the video and the text as well, all right? So we have the, because the Puki, so the Puki text too, because I had to revise it after finding out about the typos there. And uh, there may be more. Feel free to correct me. And then this is would be the actual the video itself. All right. So and, you can, and he's got everything. I, I every you can listen to it then. All right. So you have the the template that you will use for the other three, but don't worry about those right now. Right now, just do the clause analysis. All right. So that is more straightforward, and that's what I'm wanting you to do by the tenth of February. All right, that is the, the clause analysis. And the clause analysis basically to, to follow in much the same way as I have done here with, with the text I'm providing for you as the model. All right, so I hope that, uh, I, well, I've really gone to the end of the 806 already. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on and on. Uh, but I did want to explain all these things. Now, you probably may have some questions. So let's take a break. All right, let's take a break now for about, let's uh, plan on coming back around uh, 8.15. All right, 8.15. In the meantime, feel free to ask uh, questions. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you have some questions, if you want to, voice it out. When we come back, I'll give you a chance to also speak it out if you have any questions. All right. For now, let's just concentrate on what I've been, what I'm asking you to do. So make sure that you sort of understand the, what's entailed. You have the four kinds of analysis. You have the due dates. I will put them, they will be up on Canvas, so you will submit on Canvas. The first assignment you'll submit as a Word document. The subsequent, step two, three, and four, you'll be submitting an Excel file, all right? The Excel file be a, a copy of what you're doing, so the first time you'll only be filling in theme. The next time you'll be, you'll have both theme and transitivity, and the third time with that step four with the logical analysis. And we will be going through and talking about what these are and what's entailed. We've talked about theme now, and uh, I will talk next week about the theme analysis that I've done with that text, which I'm doing, all right? I'm calling it the puff text, all right? And you are doing the pookie text.
when we get to the end of all of these, uh, after much further on after week 10, week 11 or thereabouts, I'll be talking to you about my sort of commentary on the Puff text and looking forward to your commentary on the Pookie text. Well, I really can't stop talking, can I? It's about 10 after now, so let's, I have 10.20, and let's take the break. Okay, see you. Okay, uh, I think we are, let's see, resume share. And we're back. Question about slide 16. Uh, what was slide 16? Let me just go back. 16. And the question, why only A and C contain textual theme in slide 16? A, no, no, no. A is the correct answer. Only A uh, is textual theme, uh, not C. C, the text for your reading assignments, but I'll blow it to Canvas. Only A is the correct answer. All right. So it said, your question was, why only A and C contain textual theme in slide 16. This is slide 16. The first one, textual theme. Textual themes are basically what? Conjunctions. Okay. Words that are indicating. Uh, also, if you were giving a, a text analysis, you said first, second, or first in addition, finally. Those would be serving a, a textual function. All right. So adjuncts uh, or conjuncts can be used to indicate uh, a textual theme. Here, though, it's only A, all right? So are there any questions related to uh, the assignment? Have I explained it clearly enough? And I think it will help if you go online to Canvas uh, and take a look. Uh, if you take a look at Canvas and look at what I put there, I think it will be more obvious when you, especially you look at the at the Excel file, all right, and you see the template because I've prepared the template so you have the theme and logical and uh, transitivity, all right, so, and as we proceed, now as I said today, I was doing the model of my, my clause analysis of that text, which is your next step, and then next week I'll talk about the theme analysis that I did of the Puff text and that will be a model that you can then follow uh, when you do yours. So I think we'll proceed through this. I'm hoping my goal is that you really feel confident with these kinds of analysis. And then at the end of the day, when you've done these analysis, you feel, yes, there's a point to it. Yes, I see something here. I see how language is being used. Now come back though, I do want you to see also understand rhetorical structure theory because that is also a part of the coherent structuring of the text. Review very quickly. What are the underlying assumptions of rhetorical structure theory? That a text has an organization. That organization it consists of parts. All of the parts contribute to the writer's purpose, what the writer wants to say. Every part is connected. And there's a hierarchy. These you have smaller into ever expanding larger parts. Going from what's at the bottom of 
at the bottom of this hierarchy, if we're talking about bottom up, it would be the clauses at the bottom. Halliday says the clause is the most basic lexicogrammatical unit. There in the clause, you see all those metafunctions, the textual, the interpersonal, the ideational, all realized grammatically there in the clauses. But then those clauses combine to sentences, sentences to paragraphs, and on and on upward to what's at the top, the text as a whole. And every, all along this hierarchical organization, every part relates to the other part. So what are the relations? The relations are spelled out in rhetorical structure theory. Now this is what I provided to you on Canvas. And uh, again, just so you know where it is, if you go to readings, you will see RST relations and examples, all right? This is very helpful. I do want you to pay attention to this because it's not just sort of, oh, anyhow, what kind of relation is it? No, they are defined. And the reason they are defined is so that there can be sort of, when you do your analysis, I understand what you mean by justify or motivation or enablement, so on, okay? So please do refer to this. And back to, yes, do look at that RST uh, description and it lists out the definitions of the relations. Pay attention to that. Now, let's take an example. It looks awful, right? This is an abstract for an article, a journal article. Now, if I said to you, what's the rhetorical structure of this text? Oh, you probably think, wow, that is, that looks so difficult to make sense out of. Basically, you, you know, if you're not into phonology, then can you even understand what's going on? My point is this, yes. And that's why I want to go through it. And I want, even though we're not, I'm not an expert in phonology. There's a lot that's being discussed here, which I don't know related to someone who's an expert in phonology and so forth. No, I, that's out of my sort of area of expertise, but I can understand it and I can understand the coherent structuring of this text and I do so how? Okay, one thing is theme. That's kind of thematic progression. Notice Urbanchik, 2005. Second sentence, Urbanchik. Sentence five, Urbanchik's claim. He keeps mentioning Urbanchik. This is how it begins. Obviously, it is talking about some other researcher. And so th that continuity just sort of gives us a sense of the block that from one to five, it's about Urbanchik's ideas. What he's, he or she, I don't know, what they said, all right? But then when we get to six, notice in this paper, we shifts there. It shifts from talking about Urbanchik, that was the background, to talking about what is being said in this present paper. Now notice it continues on. We, we, 16, we, 19, we, continuous thematic progression. That continuity in choice of theme shifted from talking about Urbanchik, now it is about what the authors, we, are saying in this particular abstract. All right, so theme, thematic progression is signaling to me one aspect of the structure of this text. All right, let's, let's, let me try to map this out. Well, what I'm gonna highlight are those sort of clues. Now I said one through five was sort of one span. I said it has a continuity. It's all about Urbanchik, right? 
Now, I have two parts to it. Urbanchik extends previous ideas and 2A Urbanchik shows. So I'm going to sort of split them up. They're sort of symmetrical. Urbanchik this and Urbanchik that. It's quite symmetrical. Joint. Two ideas so that are being presented. Now, two through five. How am I going to? If I go through and if I take a look, is there anything that gives me idea, a clue as to what's going on? For example. Oh, so then what follows is an example. Well, that's elaboration. Now, if I go through and I look at three, I'll notice something else and I'll, I'll come to that. Okay, two, two A to two B, projection. Urbanchik shows that, we have a that clause, all right? So that was projection. How do I know that B and C are related by condition? Well, depending on, that's a condition for what preceded it. All right, so I have these sort of clues I, honestly, I'm not really reading the paper, reading the abstract. I am simply identifying, and what I'm trying to say is this, that the way this paper is written, which is rather good, it is clearly laying out to me the sign posts that this is the rhetorical structure for this, for this abstract. Carry on. Now, notice I have four and five. Now, notice how are four and five related. Whereas the distributive requires an identical stress pattern in reduplicate and base, the diminutive. Now, notice what's 4A? What's the subject? The distributive. 4B, the diminutive. We'd also say that they were theme, right? 4A, 4B, the distributive, the diminutive. Ah, do you see what's in three? Look back, reduplication for both repetitive, distributive, and diminutive. That was the, in three, what was the focus? Distributive and diminutive. Now what's theme for 4A, distributive? What's theme for 4B, the diminutive? Thematic progression, linear thematic progression is showing me how these are all sort of related, these ideas. Now notice that Urbanchik's claim is that this stress shift, now where did we see, do we see any mention of stress shift before? In 4B, what do you notice? The diminutive requires a stress shift. And then we get to five, where Banchik's claim is that this stress shift. Again, we have that sort of crossover where what was mentioned at the end of one, we see very nearly at the end of the other, at the beginning of the other. Again, a kind of linear thematic progression. Contrast, how do I know there's contrast between 4A and 4B, the whereas? How do I know that there's condition, if, then, conjunctions? How do I know that there's sort of an otherwise? Well, that I have to read. Herbanchik's claim is that this stress shift functionally serves to differentiate the two duplemes. If there was no difference in stress, then the resulting surface forms would be homophonous and therefore ambiguous. On the one hand, 5A, this stress shift serves to differentiate Otherwise, if there was no difference in stress, then the resulting surface forms would be homophonous and therefore ambiguous. Yeah, now there's no conjunction there that tells me otherwise. I did have to sort of read that to be able to interpret it. Elaboration, for example, contrast, however. Again, I'm not gonna go through the whole text here highlighting those other things that, now we see contrast, 8A and B, contrast, seven, but, but, but. 
A, B, and C, avoiding, thus avoiding, otherwise, the otherwise, the word is said there, <laughs> otherwise, all right? It actually uses the words that describe the relations, evidence, evidence, projection. We argue that. Elaboration. Again, we would be taking a look at it, taking a look at what's being described. There is no for example here. It just continues to describe it and talk about it. I'm not saying that every, every sort of relation that is, every pairing here is signaled. Some of it you have to sort of, yes, read to, to figure it out. Well, what does that mean? That means that the more you signposts you give, the easier it is for your reader to follow what it is you're saying. I'm not saying that this text is thoroughly signposted. It is not. There are a lot of signposts. There are some things I just do have to infer after reading it. But the point is, the more you signpost, the more, and we do, we do have those devices in the language that indicate, that we use to indicate what is the coherent structuring of the text. What is Purpose to serve the to infinitive suggests that, that's projection, contrast, on the other hand, and so on, which are a, a non-defining relative clause, which are elaboration. Summary, it continues, thus we present additional evidence. All right, so it, basically the summary. My point is this, for this text, I could come up with what was the sort of mapping rather confidently because the authors or authors used what was necessary, the devices that were necessary to tell me what that coherent structuring is. There's inference, there's interpretation. And my mapping is a kind of sort of my interpretation, my theory, but my theory, there's evidence, there's reasoning behind it to back it up as to why I structure it the way I do. And so on. All right, so let me sort of summarize where we are at this point in what we've been covering. Cohesiveness, coherence are essential properties of a text. What are the properties? What makes for a cohesive text? What makes for a coherent text? Now we've, we've talked about that. Textual meaning is realized by thematic and information structures. Thematic structure contributes to a text texture, cohesiveness, and architecture. The architecture of a text is realized as hierarchically organized spans of text from clause to text related to one another by a finite set of logical relations. That, that's sort of where we're at at this point. All right, I wanna go on to the next topic. And I like this topic, all right? Uh, and it's sort of related to what you're working on, verbal art. All right, so let me sort of explain what we're going to be talking about. Whether it is the art in verbal art or the science in verbal science, what is being crafted through the metaphor making potential available in language 
our hypotheses or models about the world experienced around us and in us. Such is the semogenic power of grammar that it enables us to define the basic experience of being human. Hassan, Rukhaya Hassan, refers to the hypotheses articulated in verbal art as themes about some aspect of social life achieved through second order semiosis, a kind of double articulation so that one order of meaning acts as a metaphor for a second order of meaning. Ah, it means that what, it, what, what we're saying is that this, when you look at a text, like looking at Brandon Leake's uh, performance art, spoken word performance art, there's more than what is apparent on the surface. That's why people are moved the way they are. It's not just what's there on the surface. There's more going on. That's why it's art. There's a craft to what's going on. There is a design to what's going on. It's not just him repeating words. It's not a conversation. It's art. Why is it art? What makes it art? What, what gives it a, another meaning? What gives it a second order of meaning? That's what we need to discover. That's what we're going to be taking a look at. Now, that's verbal art. Now, science is not that far off. Scientific theorizing, likewise, would not be possible except by means of the semogenic potential in language to reconstrue our common sense view of experience as an interplay between happenings and entities into a metaphorical world of things which can be observed, investigated, and explained. You see what's happening in, whether it's in art or the innovation in language for science, it is a metaphor-making potential. And it is sort of coming from the same sort of source. Historically speaking, this metaphor making potential has been achieved over three successive waves of theoretical energy, generalization, abstractness, metaphor, each taking us one step further away from ordinary experience, but at the same time, each step may be thought of as having enlarged the meaning potential by adding a new dimension to the total model. How are we enlarging the meaning space of language? You see, I want, to, I want you to begin, and that's really why I chose these spoken word performances. I want you to begin to see a text as having maybe more than one meaning. And the kind of semiosis, the way in which we make meaning, whether there's like another kind of a second order of semiosis, another, another level of meaning making going on, which the poets and, and we'll say even the scientists are employing. Over the course of history, as the need arose for new ways to theorize the human experience, humankind has relied on the power of language to reconstrue common sense reality into one that imposed regularities on experience and brought the environment more within our power to control. Now, this is just a, my abstract for what we're going to be talking about. We'll be talking about it, begin to talk about it today. And we'll continue in, at least we'll be doing it next week as well. I hope that what you would begin to see is that it's not, by no means is it sort of a, is this kind of text linguistics a boring enterprise in which we are just looking at grammar? No. There's so much to discover about what's going on in language. So what is a metaphor? 
What is a metaphor? Now, I'm sure you will have some ideas of your own. What is a metaphor? And as I'm going to be proceeding, I'm not just going to be looking at it from the view of systemic functional linguistics. Because I was really fascinated to, to read another book. That book was The Poet's Voice in the Making of Mind. It was written by Russell Mears. He's the Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of Sydney. It's a very good book. I'm not at all saying it's a required for this course, but if you are interested in, in language and mind, making of mind in the poet's voice, oh, it's really, uh, I would strongly recommend it. And I will be talking a bit about it here. What he says is this, metaphor's most important function is to picture that which cannot be seen, and so to say what otherwise cannot be said. When language fails us, and it does sometimes, right? It just, we don't have the words for it. We don't feel that we're communicating as we want to. When language fails us, there is still some resource that there is in language and it is a metaphor making potential and the usefulness of metaphor is to picture that which cannot be seen and so to say what otherwise cannot be said all right so tim is a rock now, what does that mean? If I say Tim is a rock, well, here's the picture of a rock. All right, so it's a, it's a lexical metaphor. We're very, usually when we think of metaphor, we think of lexical metaphors. What does it mean? Now, I realize that there are some cultural differences about this. Uh, and I've heard this when I've used this example previously. When I say, and I think many English language speakers, when they say so-and-so is a rock, it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. It expresses really that person is solid, strong, reliable, dependable. Now, I know in some other cultures to say that someone is a rock just can mean they're stubborn and thick-headed and all like that. Well, when I'm saying Tim is a rock, I mean it in a positive way. Now, what am I doing? I'm saying that Tim has the quality of rockness. Taking a picture to express how I think of Tim. Now, lexical metaphors, they're very common. See that it's time for the ravagers to rise once again to glory with a new captain, Taser Face! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Your name is it's Taser Face? That's right. Do you shoot tasers out of your face? It's metaphorical! <laughs> For what? For... It is a name what strikes fear into the hearts of anyone what hears it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, whatever you say. You shut up. You're next. Okay, I think we got the idea of metaphor. All right? It's not an uncommon idea. You can see it's there in the movies too. What else did Mir say? He says it makes possible this metaphor making potential, the representation of states of feeling and imagination. Substance is given to an otherwise amorphous and fleeting reality.
this kind of reality is at the heart of those relationships that are unique to the human primate and are central to the creation of culture. Sounds like metaphor is really something that sets us apart in terms of even appreciating our uniqueness. And it's significant to, to the ability to create culture. A metaphor then is very significant. There's a phrase that Mears uses, in fact, comes from another of his books, which probably would be more difficult reading. And that one was Borderline Personality Disorder and the Conversational Model. It, it's, again, quite intriguing to me because uh, as a psychiatrist, his method for dealing with patients is what he calls his conversational model. And again, language playing an important role in his treatment of those with borderline, borderline personality disorder. But he uses a phrase, and that phrase is this, a, a metaphoric cinematic screen on which is portrayed a partially glimpsed personal reality. Think of it a minute. A metaphoric cinematic screen. You are projecting. When you use a metaphor, you are projecting. When the poet is using language in a metaphorical way, is projecting, is portraying a partially glimpsed personal reality. Because we don't ever see all there is. All right, now that was lexical metaphor. What is grammatical metaphor? We begin where the way we usually see the world, and we'll call it the default. Halliday calls it the relation of congruence. What's congruence mean? It, it is the, the straightforward, the expected, the default. By default, things are nouns, qualities we describe with adjectives, processes we describe with verbs, and so on. We can go down the list. So what we can say is that meaning and grammar are sort of tied one to the other. They're linked. Things are nouns. Verbs are processes. Conjunctions are relators. And so we have this sort of schematic here that shows language as being stratified, that we have meaning at one level, wording at another level. And we put wording down here because we sort of, it's uh, sort of under the control of meaning, all right? So we have meaning. We have things, our nouns, relators, our conjunctions, processes, our verbs. I'll come back to the point about meaning making versus meaning potential. But for now, focus on this interconnection between these two strata. The point being that we can and this is where it gets metaphorical. We can decouple the connection and recouple it another way. So that when we say that a process, a process is a verb, we can decouple that. And then instead of that process being a verb, we can make it into a noun. But when we make it into a noun, it achieves, it requires, it acquires the Nounness, the qualities of nouns, nounness, a verb used in this metaphorical way. So 
Halliday's point is grammatical metaphor becomes a means to, to innovate in language. You're innovating not just with words as pictures, but you're, you're, you're innovating at the level of grammar, structure, grammatical categories. So the, this innovativeness, this ability to sort of redraw the lines as in a way sort of cancel the default and go in a completely different direction is something that we enables our ability to innovate in language, to be creative in language. So the solvent tends to be drawn through the membrane into the solution, thus diluting it. Now that, that's very, that's using verbs. That's sort of the congruent way to talk about it. The solvent is drawn through, that's a verb, through the membrane into the solution, thus diluting it, diluting another verb. All right, so, but then it is repackaged. And there at the beginning of the next sentence, no longer as verbs, but now as nouns. Movement of the solvent across the membrane. The one way of looking at it, describing it, now becomes reconstrued a different way. We're no longer talking about these processes as verbs, but the process is a noun, movement. <coughs> Excuse me. In that speech by Donald Jung, A Tale of Two Systems, we noticed how, and I used his example before, how he sort of was expressing a certain ideology. We, here we talked about it in terms of transitivity. And if you remember, you were saying that uh, he uses a lot of doing and who are the doers? They are the, they are not people. But then that is sort of his way of looking at life. Once more, he says, we hear the echo of Emerson, the things are in the saddle and ride mankind. Things are in the saddle. They're driving. They're the ones driving where we are going not people. Well, that was one of the points that we made. Now, at the end of that, that section that we were talking about, there was this one paragraph. And in this paragraph, he says this. At one level, you can read that as a lesson on the need for humility. That those who seek to lead events must accept that often the event leads them. But at another level, it is a reminder of the power of ideas to movement, to action, well beyond the reach of those who had the ideas. There is something going on here. He's talking about two ideas, at one level this, at another level that, right? Is there a difference in his mind as to which of these is more important, more significant? At one level, you can read that as a lesson on the need for humility. But at another level, it is a reminder of the power of ideas. Which is he trying to impress more on you as being the more important point? I believe it's here expressed with a grammatical metaphor. At one level, you can read. Read. Mental. It is what you perceive mentally. Means to understand. So it's a mental process. And it's further qualified by can, possibly. You can possibly understand this. But it's all 
what you can perceive. But at another level, it is a reminder. Now, he said it, it is a reminder. He doesn't say it reminds us. If he did, then it would be sort of equal. It reminds us. Another verb, which means sort of something mental. But he doesn't. Instead, he changes that verb into a noun. It is a reminder. What did he do? He took to remind and he gave it the quality of nounness. And what is nounness? Nounness has substance. Nounness is, exists. It is a thing. So what he's doing is saying, yeah, you can read that, you can perceive that, but here this is. It is. It exists. It has substance. This is the usefulness of grammatical metaphor. He's giving us a different picture. But it's not a lexical metaphor, it's a grammatical metaphor. What he's playing with are not words, but playing with grammatical categories. Now, let's see, the time is 8.56. So I will take a break here. And uh, there was a question on the chat. Signpost, yes, you got it right. Signpost, that's what I'm saying. Signpost. All right, let's take a break here. And let's take it for, for 10 minutes. Uh, it's 8.56, so just uh, about a little after 10 after. All right, a little after 10 after. All right, so see you then. Okay, let's come back to, we're talking about metaphor. Halliday suggests that, how did we get this metaphor making ability? Where does it come from? And Halliday, I think I told you before, has done quite a lot of work with language development and how language develops in children. And he was interested when does sort of this metaphor making potential, when is it, it realized in a child's development? What Halliday observed was that as a child goes through several stages, now that's pictured on your screen over in the, the right-hand side, three stages. Generalization around age one to two years. And this is where the child goes from sort of individual reference all right what does that mean that means mommy daddy to referring to classes that's a mommy that's a daddy those are parents common nouns in other words the child develops the ability to use analogy all right so there is this sort of very early on a child can begin to generalize and so a child begins to, to develop sort of classes of referring to sort of classes of objects and, and so forth in the child's awareness. The next stage is abstractness. 
And this is around four to six years, the 46 years of age. A child can go from very concrete categories to abstract ones. And so you can think of uh, what would be some kinds of abstract concepts. Well, if we talk about uh, short, tall, those would be more concrete. We can abstract that to be height. Uh, we can talk about, uh, in other words, we are taking something which would be sort of the general, a, an abstract of some more concrete object. Short, long, length. All right, so that would be the ability to be abstract, to take concrete perceptual references and turn them into abstract nouns, for example. Now the next stage comes around age nine to 13 years. And this is the stage where a child can create metaphors. And the idea of metaphorization, not just the lexical metaphors, but grammatical metaphors as well. Halliday calls this a non-linear step because why? Well, it seems that in a way the development ever since sort of the, the child's beginning, as the child's developing generalization, abstractness, they're sort of in the same direction. The ability to generalize, the ability to, to draw out and make abstract concepts, it's sort of moving in a direction of abstraction. And then you get metaphor, which seems to be a step in a different direction. Now, you might be wondering, isn't metaphor, turning verbs into nouns, also a kind of abstraction? Professor David Butt from Macquarie University says this, the Knights move. Now, what's the Knights move? The Knights move, if you remember, if you know in chess, Western style chess, there is a one piece that is the, uh, it looks like a, a horse uh, and it can move in a two steps, one direction, and another step across. It can go either way across. Now, it looks like a horse, but it's called the knight. And so in Western style chess, it's the knight's move. Two steps in one direction, and then a third across in either direction. The knight's move. Well, the knight's move in language, in grammar, is this non-linear step in the development of higher orders of discourse construction. Meaning that this is a, and then he goes on to say this abstraction needs to be distinguished from mere abstractness. Now, I think it may be a sort of confusing idea. What, why isn't it really, you're turning the verbs into nouns, those are also a kind of abstraction. So why is it all just in the same direction? But think about it for a moment. When you turn that verb into a noun and you give it a sense of nounness, what did we say that noun represents or that noun? What is the sense of which is when? What do we usually talk about in terms of nouns? Things. Things are concrete. This is the paradox of metaphor. The more abstract that we become, the more concrete the world appears. The more abstract our theorizing about the world, the more concrete the world becomes because we're turning everything into nouns, we're turning it into things. That is paradoxical. We are turning, we're, the more abstract we become, we take a different direction. The, the direction is this paradoxical step. The more abstract we are, it leads to the more concrete.
Now, what was really curious to me was reading Russell Mears, The Poet's Voice in the Making of Mind. He likewise, he also is talking about this metaphor making potential. And he, he begins with the thing itself. And the first stage is a replica of something, a homolog of something, an exact copy of something. The next stage is something that resembles it. It is the analog. Have you ever gone to look at these Lego shops and these Lego figures? They sort of look like people. And there a child will play with them. They sort of resemble, they are somewhat resembling people, right? But they're not a replica by any means, but they resemble. That's the difference between a homolog and an analog. And what is the direction that we're moving? We're moving in a direction of comparing like with like. First, the replica, then something that resembles it. But then, that sidestep to metaphor. In what sense? What is this, again, Mears talks about it as this kind of non-linear step. Not the same direction. Suddenly, we're going in a different direction. Again, it's the paradoxical. Pattern matching. That's the sort of the the direction, that is sort of the, the what we do. We're doing pattern matching, comparing like with like, but then we compare like with unlike. We see a similarity in something that is completely dissimilar. Both adopt a way of looking at metaphor as something which is the, the paradoxical. We, our thinking is going in a particular direction. It is in abstracting, but then leading to the more concrete. Pattern matching, comparing like with like, and then we compare like with unlike. We perceive similarities in dissimilars. It was intriguing to me that you have the linguist and the psychiatrist, and when they both look at metaphor, they both see in it this sort of Oh, as Halliday put it, what was the word he used? A knight's move. This alternate possibility. This ability to be innovative, to the ability to be creative, to, to think uh, that common phrase, outside the box. What is the knight's move? The knight's move is taking that non-linear step in the direction of the paradoxical. It isn't going in the direction that we're used to going. It is taking a side step in another direction. And this we do in language. So what Halliday's point is that in looking at the history of scientific discourse, because Halliday also, and that's the fascinating part of Halliday's work, Yes, he, he, when I did the 11 volumes of his collected works, there was one volume which was all the things that he had written about the development of language in children. And then there's another volume where he looked at the history of scientific discourses. What got him interested in the history of scientific discourses? He was curious why school children found reading science difficult. And he wanted to know why. How language is used in the language, what we call the language of science, it is something that has evolved that way. And he says this, the history of scientific discourses reveals new strategies evolving, new ways of organizing the grammar as a resource for making meaning. Ah, language can be innovative. Language can be creative. It can be metaphorical. What was this need? The need arose for more powerful abstract theories of experience. 
Humankind has been empowered by the metaphor making potential of language. And what is this metaphor making potential of language? To reconstruct common sense reality, to say not it reminds us, but to say it is a reminder to reconstruct common sense reality into one that imposed regularities on experience and brought the environment more within our power to control it. How did you do that? Verbs are describing dynamic actions. They cannot stand still, but how can you make it stand still? Turn it into a noun. And when you turn it into a noun, then you can describe it you can measure it but this has really permeated not just the language of science this is how how we write not just for the university if you go out to any kind of professional career of course you're encountering this kind of language what kind of language am I talking about? We don't, children talk like this. They educated girls and then women acquired the vote. In various sort of sentences which are, you have a clause, they educated girls, the verb, they educated, and then you have a conjunction, and then you have another clause, women acquired the vote. What do we do when we talk about, when we write this in an academic setting, for example? We turn those verbs into nouns, the education of girls, the acquisition of the vote by women. We, we turn it into a nominal group, nouns that are described a, a, an event as a thing. And then to relate them, because they're no longer clauses, we need some way to relate them, we use a verb. And the verb substitutes for the conjunction. In, in other words, the language itself is evolving. The language is changing. Verbs and adjectives are becoming nouns. Educated, education. Conjunctions are replaced by verbs and then proceed it. At the same time, there's sort of a shift downward where you have these complex clauses, two clauses together, and they're turned into a simple clause. If you take a look at it, they educated girls, one clause, and then conjunction, women acquired the vote, second clause. But in the incongruent, the metaphorical, it is one clause, one verb. So what Halliday is describing is the language of science. There's, a, there's, a, there's been a grammatical drift. It creates a novel intensity in the way writers in English can construe experience. A novel intensity. What does that mean? We write turning verbs into nouns. It is something new. It is something innovative. It is the trend. It is the way the language is drifting. Remember before I showed you sort of the semantics at one level, grammar at another level, and we said they were like related, right? And I said, oh, I'll come back to this, what's meaning making versus meaning potential. This is another perspective on language. You have the instances of language. And the instances of language define what is the language. The text itself, the way we use language. We notice that we begin to turn verbs into nouns and becomes a, a novel intensity. It becomes the drift. It becomes the way we talk, the way we write. How we make meaning has become 
part of the system of language. It has become, it has defined the language. So what's evolved now then? Is a, is a particular way of writing for expressing scientific knowledge. What has evolved then, Halliday says, as the scaffolding for scientific knowledge is a dedicated semiotic system, a register of the language. It's the way we use language in the language of science. It wasn't always that way. It, evolved, it has evolved that way. It continues to change. It continues to evolve. The text itself defines, though, the way we use language defines what it means to say the system of language, the way we speak. This idea that there is a, a special register, a variety of language that we use when writing in an academic environment. It's, we know that that's the case. We can describe it. But it has been defined and evolved through these gradual shifts becoming the nature in which we use language. The shift becomes the drift. The instances become the system. This nominalizing grammar has given scientists enormous power over their environment, so much so that they can make the world stand still or even create new virtual realities. There has been a steady drift in the grammar of scientific discourses toward things. Things have been foregrounded at the expense of qualities, processes, and relations. Now, go back to this point. Let's take the analogy of, if you're having difficulty to understand this, I want you to think about a simple analogy, the weather and climate. If you go outside, that's the weather, right? That's the instance. That's the temperature now. But over time, we have a sense in which if it's at the end of January, what the weather most likely will be like, what the the temperature will likely be. We abstract out a theory about, and we call it a theory of the weather, we call it climate. Climate is an abstraction that we abstract on the basis of repeated occurrences of the weather. And so what we're saying about language is that the text itself is defining the system of language. What is language? What is English? What is Chinese? What is the language of science, the register of science? These are abstractions. These are abstractions that have, are based, though, on the instances of language, the text of language. They are theories of the text. So there is these, what is the language of science involves these sort of probabilistic shifts. In other words, the probabilities that you will be using a noun instead of a verb defines a difference in the way we use language for the language of science, verbal science. But what about verbal art? What's verbal art? How do the two relate it to each other? The language of science is very much based on this ability to metaphorize, make metaphor, especially we see it in grammatical metaphor. It is this ability to, to go for the alternate possible, the adjacent possible. Now, how does this figure into verbal art? 
poetry, drama, spoken word performance. What I'm going to be talking to you about is based on a book that influenced me greatly, and that was Linguistics, Language, and Verbal Art by Rukhaya Hassan. Who is Rukhaya Hassan? She is a, she was a world-renowned linguist in her own right. She was also the wife of Professor M. A. K. Halliday. The two. It was interesting because Professor Halliday was largely interested in the language of science, and and Professor Hassan was largely interested in the language of literature. Toward the end of their lives, they were working on a project, their, their goal. They planned to collaborate to write a book that would be to show how the language of science and the language of verbal art, how verbal art and verbal science really draw on the same resources of language, the same sort of strategies in language to be innovative, to be creative. Professor Hassan passed away before Professor Halliday did and so Professor Halliday asked me and Professor David Butt, I referred to him before at Macquarie, to help him to finish that project. And unfortunately, Professor Halliday has now also passed away. And uh, so Professor David Butt and myself are both working on this project. So this, this project is very... Uh, I should say very dear to me, all right? Uh, and not only is it to me fascinating, it is also finishing a project that both Professor Halliday and Professor Hassan had envisioned to, to do and then were both unable to complete. Professor Hassan influenced me a great deal when it comes to my appreciation of verbal art. I have to admit, you remember when they were doing the America's Got Talent and you had that one of the judges, his name is Simon Collin, he said, I really don't get poetry. I don't really get it. I was sort of like that. I sort of didn't have much of an appreciation for poetry. But my view has changed considerably. One of the influences was this book here, Linguistics, Language, and Verbal Art. Professor Hassan talks about there being two orders of meaning. On the one hand, there is the simple sort of verbalization. There is, like we see in language, there is semantics, there's lexical grammar, there's phonology, right? It's just the, that's language. That's the way you hear me speaking now. It's the verbalization. But her point is that when we look at the language of verbal art, art, whether it's poetry or it could be drama or it could be a spoken word performance, something else is happening. She calls it symbolic articulation. where the meanings of language are turned into signs having a deeper meaning. Take that, take that word apart, symbolic articulation, to articulate, to express, what? Symbols. What are metaphors? Metaphors are symbols. Basically, it's this metaphor making potential in, in language, this ability to articulate symbols, metaphors, and how is this achieved? She's saying that this is a means by which we can create this second order of meaning. 
what is symbolic articulation? How do we articulate symbols? How do we articulate metaphors? What she says it is through a process of what she calls foregrounding. What is foregrounding? Foregrounding is, Professor David Butt, I'll refer to him, he says this, mobilizing the habitual patterns of grammatical choice into a non-habitual consistency. Think about it a minute, okay? Mobilizing, taking, using the habitual patterns, the ways that we're typically using language. To use an ing verb to mean something that goes on and on and on. Mobilizing the habitual patterns of grammatical choice into a non-habitual consistency. A regularity that isn't the way we usually use language. A non-habitual consistency, a regularity, a pattern. We, the, the artist creates a pattern. But then what is foregrounding? You, you can see that picture there, all right? So the picture is rather metaphorical. You know, all these trees, right? So all those trees there are sort of grouping them all there like that. It's sort of a non-habitual consistency. It creates a background. And what do you do with the background? You foreground. And you see that white line that's sort of, sort of like a waterfall? Stands out. It's brought to the fore. It's foregrounded. What Hassan is saying is that what the artist does is that the artist creates patterns, which the artist then proceeds to break. And why? To be able to communicate a theme. Now, theme, not in the typical Halliday sense. No, this is more the literary sense. Not theme in the sense of what occurs first, all right? Put that out of your mind for just a moment. The motif. Or, as she says, the hypothesis about some aspect of the life of social man. Remember Mears, a partially glimpsed personal reality? That is that, that partially glimpsed. It is a hypothesis which the artist brings and which the artist is trying to convey and put this across to the reader to the listener, this hypothesis. And it is created through the act of not only creating a background, mobilizing the habitual patterns of language choice into a non-habitual consistency, a pattern, but then foregrounding, breaking that pattern to draw your attention to and create a theme. Theme is the message of an instance of verbal art. It's the message. If as a reader, Hassan writes this, one failed to get it, then the work has not been read so as to facilitate engagement in public discourse on verbal art. If as a serious student of verbal art, one cannot engage in discourse on how the theme was symbolically articulated via verbalization, then one's assessment of the work will fall way below the standard required for teaching literature as an academic discipline. If you want to really get at what is the art, then you have to have an appreciation for an understanding and awareness of how the artist crafts that text using symbolic articulation, using foregrounding. As Hassan says, theme is, this does not necessarily mean a theme is what initially engages the reader, meaning you might not see it. You just listen to the, the 
the, the spoken word performance, right? Maybe you didn't get it. But the point is that what is staying, what's, what she says is this, is what's going to stay in your consciousness long after you you looked at the how the the phrasings and the wordings and so forth long after that's forgotten this is what's going to stick with you you may not realize it this is part of the craft it's almost unseen it is almost not visible it is though discoverable and that's the point it is discoverable it is discoverable when we know what we need to look for in language, and it is the choices that we make. It is mobilizing the habitual patterns of language choice into a non-habitual consistency, being able to use the resources of grammar to create a patterning against which, against which the, the writer will, will break it and thereby draw your attention to it. Attention to this hypothesis that the writer is trying to communicate to you. This partially glimpsed personal reality. Hassan admits, even the most assiduous student of verbal art cannot retain the actual patterning of language patterns at the verbalization level of specific works. But if the ideological message of the work has spoken to the reader, who him or herself is obviously not ideologically innocent, theme, the theme impression will last. It's beyond words, okay? It's beyond that first order of meaning. And why I want you to see this is I want you to see that a text is more than just that first order of meaning. I want you to be able to appreciate how that second order of meaning is going to become aware. That's why I'm choosing this spoken word performance for you to work on. Because what I want you to do is I want you to begin to see that a text, on the one hand, you can analyze and you can identify the, the verbalization. You can look at the language patterns. That's what you're doing in the assignment. But then you can take it another step and discover how the writer crafts the message. You can discover what is that second order of meaning. Hassan continues, having analyzed the symbolic articulation of theme, and here theme she's using in Halliday's sense, in Shakespeare's As You Like It, one is not likely to forget the various guiding forces of equilibrium in human action, reflection, locution, which keep the material and social world sweetly rotating in peaceful harmony. No. People in literature very often are sort of skeptical of we linguists when we approach literature. Why? Because we're sort of counting things. We're sort of quantifying things. Hassan writes this, there's widespread feeling that by adopting precise linguistic techniques and terminology for the analysis of literary language, one would be gaining a trivial accuracy without gaining any deeper insight in the nature of literature as a distinct kind of language activity. This is not though, and the argument that we will make and we will be pursuing and we'll be talking about more next week is that what you are engaged in here is not some form of trivial pursuit. It is not trivial. Now, she admits that the way in which some linguists have approached texts and sort of and with their frequency tables and identifying what's ungrammatical about the, the writing has made it seem trivial.
I'm going to be concluding on one or two slides more, so be patient with me. Rukhaya Hassan, and this is Lance St. John Butler. He's describing her work. He says this, Rukhaya Hassan, perhaps the strongest Halidayan of them all, has devoted some time to the topic of the specifically literary. In her paper, The Place of Stylistics in the Study of Verbal Art, and her book, Linguistics, Language, and Verbal Art, she makes an intriguing compromise between the linguistic gospel of Halliday and the special concessions needed to deal with the phenomena of literature. Hassan's work is a good first step towards the sort of liberation we need. She is aware that a linguistic analysis of a text, stylistics in action, is a vast undertaking. Even as simple a sentence as Robert Frost, I wonder about the trees, needs exhaustive analysis at the levels of semantics, syntax, lexicon, phonology. And she imagines the innumerable tables listing frequencies of tokens of different types from the various levels of language. But, but she rejects this method. And she objects that without any hypothesis, one can do very little with such tables. How could one form an interpretation from them? Straight linguistic analysis can say nothing about the text as art. What is it saying? The writer has a hypothesis. And what I am trying to do as a linguist is to discover what is that hypothesis. And, then, and in so doing, I am arriving at a hypothesis about the writer's hypothesis. What does that mean? The writer's hypothesis is how they view the world, how they understand the world. Some aspect of the life of social man mirrors a, a partially glimpsed personal reality. That is what we are attempting to identify. And I will, I will, be creating a hypothesis about that hypothesis. And what do you do with a hypothesis? You test it. You find the evidence to, to, to argue for it one way or the other. And that's exactly what we're going to do with a text. When we take a text, we are looking at, we're drawing a hypothesis about that text, a, about how language is used to make meaning in that text, how in the case of verbal art, language is being used to create a second order of meaning. We have a hypothesis, and that hypothesis is tested against linguistic evidence. I haven't given you examples yet, and that's what we'll do next week. And I believe I will be able to illustrate to you and show you not only through Hassan's analysis of several poems, but my analysis of other poems as well. And I believe that we can make that point. So hold this thought. Please work on the clause analysis. I will be putting on Canvas the, 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 the assignment so that you can uh, complete it and post it on Canvas. All right? So please wait for that to be appearing in coming days. Right, so I'm going to say good night. It's 9.50 and uh, uh, time to say good night. Okay, see you next week. Thank you, good night. Thank you, good night.